Marriage counselors, what are the most common mistakes couples make? Expecting one person to be everything for them. You need friends, co-workers, a support system, and hobbies. Keeping secrets or lies. Failure to communicate effectively, this can be taught. Being someone's everything is very exhausting too. Like, I've got a life outside of you. School, friends, family and don't forget me time. I went to 5 sessions with my wife during a tough period. The best things we learned from that is. 1. Never lash the other with past misbehaviors when trying to resolve a current issue. We have been married 17 years so there is limitless crap we can pull out of our history together to highlight past wrongs and that just derails what could be a quick resolution. 2. When one half says I am not happy about X. Do not respond with OK but I am unhappy with Y. Fix X. Get settled. Then bring up Y if you still need to. Especially number 2. This is not a comparison. My being bad to you once doesn't justify you being bad to me, and vice versa. 1. Keeping score. A partnership is a team, not a competition. Whether a person keeps score of everything they have done, or everything their partner has done, it is a death knell for the relationship. This is one of the most common causes of resentment in a relationship, and you see it often when people use absolute terms to describe themselves or their partners. That is, I always, she never, remembering that each person has his her own needs, abilities, skills, and boundaries is essential to a healthy couple. 2. Expecting that because your significant other knows you better than others and is around you most, that they are aware of all of your thoughts and feelings. Your partner is not psychic, and no matter how often they are around you or how well they know you, they cannot pick up on every nuance to determine how you are feeling and how they should respond. That is called emotional babysitting, and it cascades into a host of problems and unnecessary hurt. In response to point 2, I banned the phrase you should just know from my vocabulary after experiencing how stupidly frustrating that sentence is. People sometimes forget why they just walked in a room. It's not reasonable to think that even if hints were dropped or things were insinuated that your partner understands you without you saying your thought clearly and truthfully to them. Not listening. Most people listen to respond and don't listen to hear. This is what I spend the most time teaching couples how to do. Therapist here. Have served couples. Number one problem I see is overactive threat response creating anger and rigidity. People don't stop to turn down their defense mode and lose sight of love because all their energy is going towards being right or controlling the outcome. Of course that control comes from a place of fear, but fear and vulnerability feels too dangerous, so it typically gets expressed as anger, frustration, or rigidity. Surrender to not having control, accept what's in front of you, and cultivate compassion. Please, because you're rigid couples who just can't prioritize empathizing with each other over your fear response are driving me nuts. It's fear of loss, not a lack of empathy. If I am wrong, then it means I did a bad thing in the relationship and that will harm their view of me. It's okay if they did the bad thing, because I know I will forgive them, but I can't guarantee the same in the reverse, so I must win. As soon as couple stops being on the same team, fighting all the bulls of life together things fall apart get on the same team get behind each other's goals if you're not on the same team you're just going to wind up annoying the frick out of each other all that bulls of life is going to be beating you down and your life partner is just going to be part of it instead of a refuge that's kind of how my last relationship ended we ended things before it got too bad and are still friends but our life goals were becoming too incompatible and we knew we wouldn't both make it through to the other side. When your significant other brings something to your attention that they need want, don't react harshly if it's something they've refused to bring up sooner. Getting loud or defensive why didn't you bring this up sooner will make them shy away from bringing things up again due to negative reinforcement backlash. This is especially true if they've been victims of any kind of abusive relationships. Source. Literally killed my marriage because I was an idiot and didn't respond in an open, non-positive way. Bro. I feel you. Lost my girl because I cold and tc that I was acting selfishly sooner, I am just paying for my stupidity, I really love the girl and am willing to do my best for her well-being, I just realized that a little late. 
One of the most toxic things I have found in doing marriage counseling is when couples think of themselves as individuals who happen to be together and not as a couple. Not that I'm advocating enmeshment. That's not really marriage. That's having a roommate. Or perhaps less than that even. Marriage is a union of two people. That's what the unity candle and sand and knots are all about. There is a bringing together of two lives that is inseparable. If either member still conceptualizes themself as a solely autonomous individual whose actions and dispositions impact only themselves, things will go bad eventually. They go bad because it results in a person caring more for themselves than their spouse. This is seen where couples spend money behind each other's backs because it's my money. Why does it matter when couples keep secrets from each other, which inevitably results in pain? This is seen when couples don't stop to consider their spouse's thoughts, feelings, desires, dreams, abilities, and strengths alongside their weaknesses. The remedy to this is behaving as a unit in small ways and in large. If you're getting something from the fridge, see if your spouse wants something. It even helps in arguments. No longer is it spouse against spouse but it's the married couple against the issue causing stress to the unit. When one person considers a course of action, their thoughts ought to be about how it impacts the unit. TL, DR, and the two shall become one flesh so they are no longer two but one. Well put. Enjoyed this. Feel like I've learned something. People don't learn to fight. You have to fight fair in a relationship. People go nuts when they get mad and some couples never learn to fight in a way that honors the person you are fighting with. It is so important to learn to respect space, don't assume motives, and take turns in explaining your views. It's a big deal and I work on it quite a bit in counseling. This is really a part of relationships. People change and one of three things happens. 1. You change in the same direction. 2. You change in different directions and find a new arrangement for the relationship and new personalities. 3. You change in different directions and you don't find a new arrangement. We had some friends who got married and we tried so, so, hard to keep them from getting married. He was immature, and she was incredibly immature. She had been engaged three times. Each time she was dating the next person within a month of the engagement falling through. In one case it fell through less than a month before the wedding and she was dating the new guy within a week. This is actually the two friends that ended up getting married. They constantly fought. I mean, constantly. I've been present when he's taking off his ring and asked if she wanted it back. Last I saw of them they were still fighting constantly and I'm convinced the only reason they're still married is because they're religious and don't want to be seen in a divorce or don't realize how miserable they are. I don't know if they will ever mature, but knowing each one I know that they will do so in very different directions. This is why people who have not matured should not get married. I work with couples and their relationships a lot, in my line of work, and do some forms of counseling though it is not my job or training. But one of the common threads I see running in the midst of relationships marriages that fall apart is a kind of selfishness. People that don't quite realize that marriage works best when you are both acting in the other's best interest and seeking their happiness more than your own. It crops up a lot, but not exclusively, in sex intimacy. If your primary concern in sex is you, you are not going to build any kind of bond or intimate connection, and nor is it going to be much fun for your partner. Marriage is a lot about sacrifice and the couples I see thriving are the ones who are each willing to make sacrifices for the other and for their family. Couples who get married thinking that the coming decades of marriage are going to be exactly like the dating or the honeymoon phase, when they face major challenges or speed bumps in their life together, have a real hard time dealing with it. But I thought I was supposed to be happy. Not a marriage counselor but, going to a marriage counselor believing that it's like a judge and s he will tell them who's right and who's wrong. The gang gets analyzed. Current marriage? couple and family masters counseling student here, and spoken family rules that you bring into relationship are huge. Obviously you didn't grow up together and depending on how you did you grow up you may have had completely different family of origin foo experiences. It can be as simple as your foo separated out laundry by color and your so's just threw everything in together so you have different family rules regarding laundry. To your foo had the rule of family problems stay in the family and your so's family talk to people outside the family about all the problems freely. Everybody has these rules. 
Talking about them and uncovering them without judgment will go a very long way in maintaining and deepening connection. If you don't talk about them it is easy to get into negative interactional patterns that are just rehearsals of how your food did things and not creating healthy, mutually safe patterns. Also, I recommend that everyone in relationship take an attachment style quiz and compare their attachment style, secure, anxious, or avoidant, because that reveals a lot of unspoken rules as well. I'm not a marriage counselor but my wife posted a very meaningful and controversial article the other day and tagged me in it because I agree with its philosophy. It was titled your kids should not be the most important part of your marriage. Of course, many parents were offended and complained bitterly about the article. But we don't make our kids the center of our marriage. We devote a lot of time to them and keep them healthy and educated. Of course, but we spend just as much time on each other. If mom and dad are happy, the kids are likely to be happy. On many occasions, my wife will rush to get a few things done for the kids in the morning and ask me, playfully hey, you wanna do me in the bedroom real quick and I will fix dinner and get the kids to bed so her and I can have some fun and cuddle while we talk about our day. Kids don't define your marriage, you and your spouse absolutely do. My parents had this philosophy too, and I'm so happy they did. Of course I took it for granted at the time, but having that much stability and safe feeling at home made me a very secure and confident child teen adult. I'm in my 30s now and still have a great relationship with my parents. Not to brag but they did an amazing job haha. <laughs> Not a counselor, bit of advice I received a long time ago, from a nurse. I was working a unit as a CNA, and the old, intimidating, and smiling veteran nurse, my favorite, on the unit walks onto the unit from lunch holding hands with her husband, a Terry Pratchett look alike. My young 20ish self commented that you don't see that every day. She retrieves her battered clipboard from the desk, leans into me, and says, You want to know the secret, kid? I say yes, because who doesn't want to know that secret? And there's this collective lean in from the entire desk. Docs, nurses, support, pens stop moving. People don't know how to grow and change together. You will change as you age. So will your partner. The question is, do you know how to grow and change together? Then she walks off the answer a call light. Wisdom to hold on to. The girl you marry doesn't exist anymore. She's grown, up, hopefully, and changed. Biggest mistake is waiting too long to get help. Repeat issues coming up again and again will not resolve themselves. Get help before it's helpless. As I'm recently divorced marriage therapist, I cannot stress enough how important acknowledging repair attempts and keeping intimacy alive are as life-sustaining nutrients for your marriage. BTW, my ex is a therapist who changed religions and no longer thought sex was important. Sexual incompatibility, misunderstanding sex as a bonding activity, when one or the other believes sex is something one does to another as if it was just a utility. Wife doing her masters in psychology and has a certificate in marriage counseling. The main mistake being the use of the word you your or any similar words targeting the other partner in an argument. For example you said you would do the dishes. This puts the person receiving the comment into a defensive mode and they stop listening and get defensive. Thus, communication breaks down. I've been married for 10 years and my partner is an MFT. All of the suggestions in this thread are wonderful and accurate. The one thing that I want to add on to them is probably the biggest lesson that my partner and I have discovered over time. People change. You will change. They will change. It is now impossible to have the same relationship two years and that you did at the start. Don't try to hold on to it. The only way my partner and I have stayed together for as long as we have is because we were able to adapt to each other. That being said, don't try to force a relationship that's inherently dysfunctional. It's not a mark of failure for a relationship to end. Change seems scary, but the truth is you've already changed. Not a marriage counselor but attorney who deals with some divorces. Technically I am a counselor at law of sorts. The most common mistake I see is people getting married without any understanding of the legal repercussions. Honestly, I think forcing couples to take an 8 hour family law class before getting married would cut down on the amount of people who get married. Like, it's actually a pretty scary concept and it should be normal to not trust someone with as much power as you give them when you get married. Basically once a week, I get a phone call like, 
My wife husband is spending all my money. I need a divorce and my money back. That money is gone and it is almost certain there is nothing you can do about it. It's like people literally have no idea about the concept of marital estate. My wife and I have been together for nearly 30 years and happily married for almost 20. Communication is key. My parents had very poor communication skills when I was growing up, and I saw how it affected them and I also often bore the burden of enduring their silent anger. I vowed to not do that. It can be difficult, but you have to talk. This is critical. Of course, every couple is different, and has different ways to converse, but it must be done. The most important thing I would stress is don't go to bed angry. If my wife and I have a problem, we talk it out or the lights stay on until we're done. You cannot let those silent wedges dig their way into your souls. Something will break eventually, and may be irreparable. I would like to end with a very positive example of communication. Last Saturday my wife and I woke up and started cooking for an evening to be spent at a friend's house to watch the new Deadwood movie. We love the series and have watched it at least 4 or 5 times. We were going to make a themed meal of a crock pot of chili with cornbread and of course, peaches with authorized cinnamon. My wife put on the soundtrack for the show, and we got started in the kitchen. As she was taking something down from the cupboard, I noticed the scattering of grey in her hair. Then the Lyle Lovett song Old Friend began to play. It had never meant much to me before, but in that moment it hit me so hard, I nearly broke down on the spot. Remember how Emily dissolved into a puddle? That's what my heart did. I realized that she is my old friend. Of course, I don't think of her as old, but we're both getting older. Still, at 63 she's often mistaken for being a decade younger. Attitude and energy counts for a lot, and that's part of the reason why we fit so well because we still feel young at heart. I took a minute to compose myself and we carried on cooking, but that feeling wouldn't go away. It wasn't as if I didn't know that she's the love of my life. But that moment was such an intense confirmation that it took me two days to tell her because I wasn't sure that I'd get through it without breaking down. And I didn't want her to think that my tears meant something was wrong. I told her yesterday afternoon when I got home from work, and she was so happy to hear it. She's been out of work for six months, and really struggling with feelings of inadequacy and attractiveness. We've both gained some weight, but to me, she's still as beautiful and sexy as ever. She really appreciated hearing how I felt exactly because she was dealing with all these negative thoughts, and just me telling her how I felt was a big boost for her. Talk to your partners. People. Don't assume. Confirm. Love needs to be nurtured in order to last. Do the work. Not exactly a marriage counselor but speaking from experience. 1. Allowing family's friends to get too involved in the relationship. Remember the saying two men are cooks spoil the broth? Yeah exactly this. 2. Assuming you know exactly what your partner wants at any given point in time. People will not always be in the frame of mind we expect them to be. Sometimes it's best to give them their own space. 3. Not discussing finances deep enough or avoiding it altogether. 4. Discussing really important decisions making these decisions via text messages. 5. Not opening up to each other for fear of having a conflict. This tends to mount up tensions deep down inside and will normally come up when an argument occurs there by adding more fuel to the fire. 6. Adopting a tit for tat policy. One should aim to put their 100% commitment into a relationship for the sake of the relationship itself and not because they expect return sooner or later. Marriage counselor and TX. Probably one of the biggest mistakes that couples make is forgetting that they're on the same team, and they fight to win instead of fighting to resolve. Focus on hearing and understanding each other, and engage in disagreements with an eye on coming together, and compromise will follow easily. Also, sex is good, important, and okay to talk about. Couples make the mistake of thinking that sex is one of those things that they should just intuitively understand, but life doesn't work like that. They confuse love with the chemical high you get early in our relationship. That cannot last, for reasons built into our biology. A successful relationship is to build on that feeling. It's built on mutual respect and a mutual decision to make it work each day. When you're hurt, say so, and stop trying to hurt back. When someone does something or says something hurtful, whether conscious or not, let them know in a non-accusatory way before you begin the game of throwing daggers. 
Much of the relationship damage that couples endure is the back and forth hurt each other game that snowballs out of control, causing a ton more damage. Husbands accidentally tripping and finding their ones in another woman, or alternatively wives offering a tight, warm space to a new friend's cold penis. Baby it's cold outside. The best advice I've seen online. The person you divorce is the person you married, aka expecting people to change who they are. IDK people do change and grow, but if you know your partner doesn't want kids and you think maybe they will change their mind, or they think you will change yours, goals and wants and expectations usually don't change too much. Love isn't something that just happens, and the puppy love at the start is a farce. Love is conscious everyday choice, and a lot of people get bored and assume they aren't in love anymore. At that point they've made their choice. My grandparents just hit their 68 year anniversary. I asked my grandpa, what's the secret his response? Constant bickering. I was asked once, what is marriage? 50 stroke 50 60 stroke 40 75 stroke 25. I said 50 stroke 50, nope. The answer is 100 stroke 100. Both must be willing to do everything for each other, all of the time. Simple as that. Free advice I thought I would pass along. Another divorce lawyer here. Get to know each other before you jump into marriage and kids. I cannot tell you. No really. Ethically I can't. How many cases of mine are parenting plan child support actions. And a few very short term marriages. That are a result of having tons of unsafe sex that results in a child within a few months of meeting each other. Once you have kids together you are bonded for life. So all the better for you and your offspring if you like each other enough to be in it for life. 70% of fights are occurring. And usually very fixable and small. Learn to communicate instead of fighting out those fights make them mature conversations. Don't assume anything that another human being is thinking. Start gently. If you get flooded leave the room and remind everyone involved in an argument to speak gently. I am a clinical mental health counselor and I do quite a bit of marital, family, and premarital counseling. This is a question with many different answers, many of which have been answered in the hours before I arrived in the thread. I had clients today, but, if there is one thing I would say is the most important factor in success or failure in a relationship, it is active listening. People nowadays simply do not know how to actively listen to one another. Social media and a false sense of hyperconnectivity make this issue much much worse. Older couples with beautiful mutually supportive marriages have naturally identified the importance of listening, and have negotiated the ways their partner needs to be heard. Relationships succeed or fail on this simple premise. Be still, and listen to your partner. Tobias, you know, Lindsay, as a therapist, I have advised a number of couples to explore an open relationship where the couple remains emotionally committed but free to explore extramarital encounters. Lindsay, well, did it work for those people? Tobias, no, it never does. I mean, these people somehow delude themselves into thinking it might, but, but it might work for us. I will say this the never go to bed angry rule sucks. I have gotten more angry at my SO for wanting to talk it out when all I wanted was sleep than how angry I was about the original argument. Her argument being sleep doesn't matter we need to fix this but seriously if I get a good night's sleep I won't be nearly as upset when I wake. If someone denies me sleep I will mad on principle. Frick off let me sleep I will be far more agreeable in the morning. It's okay to be mad it's not okay to not address it. That doesn't mean it has to happen at 2am. Not a counselor but happily married 15 years here. Your partner is your best friend. Even when you're annoyed. Even if you're having an argument. They don't stop being the person you love and the person you want to be with. So stop trying to be right and remember you're a team, both pulling in the same direction. Also, sex is not just something that happens when you reach the bedroom. Sometimes an affectionate moment in the morning leads to sex many hours later. I think that men especially tend to forget this. They can be distracted and non-affectionate all day and wonder why their partner can't just flip a switch in the evening. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video.
Bye for now.